Good morning, Eastside family and friends. So glad you could join us this morning. As I uh, put together this message this week, I was reminded of the journey that the Lord uh, began in me, even as a boy, but mostly as a young young adult. And uh, I say young adult, middle age maybe, but um, there were some incredible revelations that I had. The biggest one was that the Lord loved me incredibly. Um, and I experienced the depth of his forgiveness in an incredible way. And so he began to teach me how to follow him and how important it was to, to recognize the fact that I could not do life by myself, that I needed, I needed the Lord uh, to, to, to actually produce what he had intended for me to produce. And so he began to teach me those things on a pretty rapid basis. And so when I got into ministry, <clears throat> that was my goal. That was my motivation. That was where my passion lay, is in trying to help people understand that God's plan was better for them. I also was very uh, discontented with the condition of the church at that time and, uh, and just didn't believe that the message that the church was giving out was the same message that, that I was reading in Scripture. And so I intended in my heart was to, to, to help produce an atmosphere that had the ability to bring about change. And what I see going on right now is I see an incredible correction going on. I see God bringing correction to the church and to a nation. And the requirement is a return to him. A, ret a requirement is not to return the church. Don Potter writes a song. He wrote a song. He says, sometimes I feel like I serve the church more than I serve God. And, of course, you serve God by serving the church. But it's so easy. Those, those lines are so easy to, to get marred and to cross over and to lose sight of why you do what you do. So God's bringing correction and requiring a return to him. And so I've titled the message this morning, I'm done chasing feelings. I'm, I'm done chasing feelings, and I'm going to follow Christ. And doing that, I have to return to him. In, in the church, I believe that God is revealing error. I think he's revealing holes in the American gospel. I think he's bringing correction to our, our marketing mindset. I think he's bringing correction to a false gospel. I think he's bringing correction to misinterpretation of Scripture. I think, I think we have misinterpreted so many ideas about Scripture, including the prophetic office. The prophetic office, I think, has been perverted by the American church over the, over the last few decades in this. We, we, have, we have almost given a participation trophy to those who are, are trying to prophesy. You know, as, as long as you participate and then, as long as you're trying, you really don't have to get it right. I don't see that in Scripture. What I see in Scripture is, if there's a prophet and he's given a word and if it doesn't come true, then you don't have to fear that prophet. What's interesting is there was a requirement to fear the prophet because he's bringing the word of the Lord. And generally the word of the Lord was correction. The other thing that you see in this, in this age of the prophetic is you see, um, you see prophecy in, uh, mostly... Uh, being just encouragement. And when I say encouragement, I don't mean correction. I mean just, just you know, just about you're going to prosper, you, the blessing's going to happen, you know, all these things, all these positive things. And you never see that aspect in Scripture. What you see in Scripture is you see this corrective nature of the prophetic word from the prophet. 
And, and he, what, he, what he says is, if you'll get right with God, if you'll return to God, if you'll return to his way, then these blessings are going to happen. But if you don't, then he's going to bring correction to you. Why? Because he loves you, because he's good, and because he's merciful. So I think God is redefining what, how love is expressed. Love is expressed in correction. Love is expressed when he allows trouble to come into our lives and into our situations so that it will cause us to return to him. And last week we discussed that he calls that a sign and a wonder. When trouble comes to reveal where we are when it's contrary to the, where God wants us to be, he calls that a sign and a wonder. And so he's, he's, he's showing us the misinterpretation of the prophetic office. I think he's showing us the uh, misinterpretation of how his love is expressed. I think he's redefining signs and wonders. I think he, he is redefining what his goodness looks like. And it's making us get, get a grasp that this goodness doesn't necessarily come without trouble. Matter of fact, his goodness comes in trouble. He says that he'll, he'll work all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. In other words, stuff's going to happen. Trouble's going to come. And even in the trouble, you're going to be able to see God's goodness. He doesn't say, I'm going to remove the trouble. He says, my goodness is going to be with you in the midst of the trouble if you're about my purpose. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 4 through 9, Jesus says it like this. He said, for God commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father and mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your traditions. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah, Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And so here Jesus is already pointing out where, where we are, uh, uh, where the church and where the teachers of the day are, are teaching something that was contrary to what God said, uh, even about one of his commandments. Another thing that I think we're doing, I think we're misinterpret, misinterpret, uh, we've misinterpreted the character of God. Uh, we, we, have, we have made him something he wasn't. We have we have designed him after the created versus being the creator. And we have to understand that he desires holiness. He desires purity. And he says, he says in the last times that, that we will gather teachers that tickle our ears. And today I just... I just, I believe more than any time in my lifetime, in my 60 years, do I see the church gathering people that will tell them what they want to hear. In other words, they got this way of thinking. We've got our way of thinking about who God is, about the character of God, about his goodness, about his love, about how signs and wonders should manifest, about the prophetic office, about, about what scripture says, and about the nature and the character of the church. We've got our, our mindset on that, and we're really not very teachable. We, we, we have gathered to ourselves teachers that agree with the way we think. And I think right now, more than any time in the history of the church, we see this scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 through 5. It's, it's coming alive. It's coming alive. It says this, this is from the ESV. I've got, I've got uh, three different translations because of the importance of waking up knowing that this is the time that we're living in. And God is trying to get the church to return to him, to, to line up with him, to, to begin to put down the way they've been thinking 
and realign themselves with God, which is what we all have to do when we get saved. When we understand that we were saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. We, we don't understand the fullness of God yet. We are learning about His nature and His character, depending on the Holy Spirit to teach us. But this is what it says. For the time is coming when people would not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off in the myth. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. The New Living Translation puts it like this. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and they'll chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. I like the way the Amplified puts it. He says, herald and preach the word. Keep your sense of urgency. Stand by. Be at hand. Ready. Whether the opportunity seems to be favorable or unfavorable. Whether convenient or inconvenient. Whether it is welcome or unwelcome. You as preacher of the word are to show people in what way their lives are wrong and convince them rebuking and correcting, warning and urging and encouraging them being unflagging and inexhaustible in patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not tolerate endure sound and wholesome instruction, but having ears itching for something pleasing and gratifying they will gather to themselves one teacher after another to a considerable number chosen to satisfy their own liking and to foster the errors they hold and will turn aside from hearing the truth and wander off into myths and man-made fictions. As for you, be calm and steady and cool, accept and, uh, and suffer unflinchingly every hardship, do the work in evangelists, fully perform all the duties of your ministry. And so I believe right now, and I think I want to just present to you the idea that this is where we are. How many of you would agree that it looks like that we're certainly moving into the last days? And we understand that in the last days, these, these kinds of thoughts and ideas are going to be what dominates the church. And, and God is never going to give up on the church. God is always going to use the church. He's always going to bring correction. There's always going to be a remnant of those who are teachable, who will take the Word of God, who, who cherish the Word of God, who have a passion for it to correct their way of thinking, knowing that their way of thinking can't be right, knowing and humble enough to say, I, I know I don't get it all. I, I know that my thinking and my attitude and everything isn't the way it could be if I understood fully the nature and the character of God. His love, how it works. His mercy, how it works. His goodness, how it works. How he uses trouble to be a sign and a wonder to us. And so, as we begin to study and as we see and as I talked about last week, you know, I, I, I want to talk about, you know, this, this, this gospel that says, you know, you can, if you accept Christ, if you become a son or daughter, then, then the curse isn't on you or, or it's only blessing. It's only blessing, you know, that, that you don't reap what you sow, that there's, there's no, there's no response accountability or responsibility for your behavior. In other words, you can do what you want because you're a son and a daughter, because you're free, and, and because you're a son and a daughter, you're going to be walking in kingdom. I just don't think that that is accurate. 
And I want to talk about that and give you some, some theology on that as we move forward. Being in the last day, knowing that God's correcting the church, knowing that he's calling us to return to him, we have to recognize the fact that when we talk about the curse and the curse being put on Jesus, as mentioned in Galatians chapter 3, we have to understand that Jesus died for our justification. Jesus died for our redemption. In other words, the law could, could not redeem us. It didn't have the ability to justify our sin nature. And, and, and that was the curse. The curse of the law was we couldn't do it. And so Jesus, it says in Galatians, bore the curse of the law. What the law couldn't do, Jesus did. What did he do? He justified us. He redeemed us. He put our sin on the cross. And so we could receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? To live in blessing. How? By following the Holy Spirit. What, what, what uh, has been presented whether intentionally or not, is that all you have to do is speak a few words and you become a son and all these things are added to you because you spoke those words. And that's just not the way the gospel is presented in Scripture. The gospel is presented in Scripture if you commit your way to the Lord, if you lay down your life, if you offer yourself as a sacrifice to God, if you if you commit to his way, if you become a person of the way, if you think like he, if you respond like him. You know, I got saved, I got forgiven, and there was this the wave of forgiveness that came over me. And I had this incredible sense of the mercy of God being poured out on me. You, do you know what God's intent for me is? God's intent for me is to emulate that forgiveness. In other words, that forgiveness which he showed me, I'm to show other people. That mercy that he showed me, I'm to show other people. I'm to be as forgiving as Christ was to me. I am to be as merciful as he was to me to other people. That's why Jesus says, love your enemies. Bless those who who persecute you. Don't speak evil. Don't curse them. Bless them. Why? Because that is the character and nature of God. And, and we don't come underneath the covenant of Christ and, pro, and produce kingdom without, without surrendering and submitting to his way, which includes emulating that forgiveness. How do you do that? Well, you can't do it on your own. I can't do it on my own. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus came to justify us, redeem us, so that we could receive power by his Holy Spirit so that we could live in the blessing and, and follow the Holy Spirit. So it's other, in other words, it's impossible to live in the blessing without following the Holy Spirit. You see, that's where we miss it. We miss it by thinking that we've been given this authority independent of the work of the Holy Spirit. And we have it. We have authority because we're sons. But it is initiated by the Holy Spirit if you want it to produce kingdom. And we know that we can test whether the Spirit is speaking or giving us instruction on whether it lines up with the Word of God. Our test is always the Word of God. And how we look at it, how we dissect it, how we believe what the Word is saying is incredibly important when it comes to following the Holy Spirit. So faith in Jesus' work at the cross is our payment for sin, and He justified us. The law couldn't justify us, but Jesus' work on the cross did. Galatians 3, 2 and 4 says this, This only I want to learn from. From you, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing of faith, by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain. And then he goes on in Galatians and writes in verse 10 and 14, For as many 
as are of the works of the law are under the curse. So, he's saying in verse 10, chapter 3, for as many as are of the, of the works of the law are under the curse. So the curse, New Testament, is still being talked about for it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. In other words, if you believe that the law actually has the uh, ability to bring redemption, then you have to be faultless and keep every aspect of the law or, or it condemns you. But then no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ, verse 13, has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Why? Verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And so this whole, this whole uh, transfer to Christ so that we could be redeemed, its purpose was that we might receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. How? Through faith in what Jesus did on the cross. It's redeeming quality. Galatians 5, 4, and 6 says, You have been estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. In other words, there are people who believed in Christ and they were returning back to the law, as we saw in Galatians 3, 2. And he's saying, You've been estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by the law, you've fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor un uh, uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. So the law and the commandment are revealed as two different things. And so sometimes we, we intermingle the law and, and the commandments of God. The commandments of God uh, are are always there. God hasn't changed his mind. He hasn't changed his mind. Jesus, Paul, John, all of them expect us to bear fruit of the Spirit by obeying the commandments. Actually, the Spirit was given so that we would have the power to obey the commandments. We would want to because we'd be motivated by love. It wouldn't be motivated out of duty. It wouldn't be motivated out of denial or some some martyrism, think, uh, you know, martyrist kind of thinking, but it would be motivated by love. We would love God to such a degree that we'd want to serve him, and, and he wanted to give us the spirit to empower us to keep the commandments. In Ephesians 6, 1, Paul writes, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with you and you may live a long life here on earth. Paul is still, he is still uh, propping up the commandments of God. Now he is also clarifying that the law doesn't have the ability to redeem us or justify us, just Christ. But the commandments that God gave are still God's commandments. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 through 6, it says this, now by this we know that we know him. John's writing, if we keep his commandments. And we know that those commandments that John is writing about aren't New Testament. There's no New Testament commandments. There are, well, Jesus gives one, I give this new commandment I give you, he says. But, but that's not the only one. He's, we're talking about all the commandments of God. He says, I know Jesus, do I know God and does not keep his commandments? Is a liar, and the truth's not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who, say, he who says he abides in him, on himself, also walk 
just as he walked. And so this, this American gospel that I think God is, is kind of bringing correction to is, is the gospel that says, you know, all you have to do is, is, is make this profession of faith and you're good. And I don't see that in Scripture. I see a laying down of our life. I see an, a walking in faith. I see, an, an, a, I see an agreement with God that brings us to a place by His grace, by His Spirit, that we could have never gotten to just by trying to obey the commandments, just by doing the law. Didn't have the ability to. But the law has not been removed. In Romans chapter 8, 13 through 14, it says this, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. There's this working out of your salvation. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, are the sons of God. So, so do you know that you're being led by the Spirit of God? Are you sure? Do you have relationship? Are you in conversation? Are you including God? Is there, is there this, is this, this beckoning of God, invitation to the Lord to give you wisdom and revelation and truth so that you can respond in righteousness, so you can represent Him, so that you can do what Jesus did? That seems to be the requirement to me in Scripture. Not that you're going to be perfect, but that you have a heart to please the Lord. And so when I start thinking about, you know, the the you know, whether the curse is still here, you know, whether we're living in the blessing or not, I mean, I think we can be absolutely positive as Jesus begins to. To, to put it together in Matthew 25, and then we see also in Romans, and then we're going to see again in Revelation. We're going to see three things that I want to bring your attention to. Matthew 25, 31, Jesus is talking, and he's talking about the final separation. And he's talking about really the departing of the curse and the cursed. He took the curse of the law and justified us. But the curse is evident still here on the earth. We talked about that last week. Look at what Jesus says. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, this is the return of Christ, and all the holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand and put the goats on his left hand. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. In other words, your behavior was modified. Because of your relationship with me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Then, he will also say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed. Into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. In other words, it's not prepared for men. We're still choosing this day the blessing or the curse. And that is whether we agree with God. For I was hungry. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. 
then. They also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. Your behavior did not show that you were in relationship with me. And, and these will go away in everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. I read Romans and I start thinking about, you know, living in a time where we understand that the curse is still on the earth. Romans 8, Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us, which expresses by itself that we're having to live in a cursed environment. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the Son of God. Why? For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of this curse, from the bondage of corruption, into the glorious freedom of the children of God. There's a deliverance of the earth. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. There's going to be this time when we do not see the evidence of the curse. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. In other words, it's still there too. For we are saved in this hope. We have this hope of the removal of, of any fruit of the curse, but hope that is seen is not hope. For not, why does one still hope for what he doesn't see? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We're waiting on the day that we can live and, 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 and be under the goodness and the mercy of God and not be, not be affected by the results of the curse. Revelation 22, 1 and 3, when, we, when, we're, still, when we're still talking about the, the um, when we're still talking about God bringing us to a place of, of um, <laughs> final separation of, and, and departing. This is Revelation 22. Now, this is, this is the end. This is when Jesus is coming back. Listen to what it says. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on the other side of the river was a tree of life, which bore tw twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. Verse 3, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall, not, there shall be no night there. there. They need no lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophet sent his angel to show his servants the thing which must, be short, which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I'll John say and heard these things. So the blessing comes by obedience to the commandments of God and following the Holy Spirit. And when I heard and saw, I fell down and worshiped before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And he said to me, see that you don't do that, for I am your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and those who kept the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophet, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for this time is at hand. It's near, it's coming, it's now. 
He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You know, I see all the time in Christian gym, I see people chasing emotions all over the place. They're, they're tossed to and fro by, by their own emotions. Let me ask you something. Are you a son or daughter of God? Have you laid down your life for his way? Are you part of the way of Jesus? Do you live your life in conversation with the Holy Spirit? Doing the impossible things that can only come when you're in relationship with the Holy Spirit? <coughs> Doing the impossible things that the Spirit requires? Do you live your life in response to your feelings or in response to the Holy Spirit's instruction that agrees with the commandments of God? Do you offer others the same things, the same attitudes, the same gifts that Jesus has offered you? That's how you know you're a son. That's how you know you're a daughter. Today, I encourage you, if this is not you, if you haven't lived a life in obedience, desiring to be obedient to the word in a way that you're going to order your life, you're going to pursue with passion the way of God. You've had an encounter with the Holy Spirit that will change you forever. You can't be the same. You can't go back to the old you. If you do, you know that it's going to produce something that is not kingdom. And you're going to, you're going to walk, you're going to fall from grace, as Paul wrote. Today, I just want you to know that I choose the word of God. I hope you choose the word of God. I choose to keep his commandments. I choose to depend on his spirit to accomplish every expectation that God has for me. You see, if I try to accomplish the expectations that God has for me without the spirit, I haven't been justified. I haven't been redeemed. Jesus justified me so that he could give me power, so he could send the spirit, so that I would have the power to accomplish his expectation which is to keep his commandment, which is to respond to people like he responds to me. I, I, I'm committed and I choose this day to understand that his word is right. I choose this day to say about his word, I will do what you say. I will lay down my agenda. I will fear the Lord. I will fix my eyes on you, Jesus. Because I know that in the days, as in the days of Noah, so is the coming of the Son of Man. We find ourselves there. We find ourselves in a place where God is judging the church. He, he is correcting the church. Some of the church are going to continue to seek teachers that will just tell them what they want to hear. Will that be you? Are you going to discover, like the Bereans, what the Word of God, God says? And are you going to invite the Holy Spirit to empower you to keep the commandments so that you can live in the blessing even in times of trouble, that your hope is in the Spirit guiding you, leading you? I'm reminded of Joseph where it says, in prison, in the hole, in captivity, in false accusation, it says, and, and Joseph, and the Spirit of God was with Joseph, and he prospered. No matter what happens, no matter what trouble comes, no matter what the culture produces, we can walk in the blessing in the middle of it. How do you do that? In the power of the Holy Spirit, keeping the commandments. Father, in the name of Jesus, help us hear the true gospel that you require works. 
It is the thing that tells us that we're saved. What we do matters. Help us, God. See ourselves. Work a sign in them a wonder. See ourselves the way you see us. Repent. Turn to you. Come back to you. Come back to your word. Commit to doing it. We are of the way, the way of Jesus. I thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.